the ultimate macro system within which everything exists and upon which everything depends is the four dimensional fabric of space time. The three dimensions of space, width, depth, height, and the one dimension of time. The physical laws of space time, the laws of physics, govern all our behavior. They are why we must move forward in time, like it or not, and why we can never go back in time, to fix a stupid mistake, for instance. They are also why we cannot walk through solid objects, but must go around them. This is a photograph I captured through a small telescope of a tiny portion of our Milky Way galaxy. Every point of light, even the faint ones, is an actual star. The universe contains lots of galaxies, 200 billion or so, and each galaxy contains billions of stars. The universe is big. Our Milky Way galaxy has a diameter of over 900,000 million a million kilometers and is estimated to contain between 200 and 400 billion stars. And stars, well, they're our parents, really. The elements in our bodies, like oxygen, carbon, calcium, and so on, were all made long ago inside stars that lived and died somewhere out in the universe. Our star, the Sun, is very average. But even so, over one million Earths could fit inside. All life on Earth depends on the Sun. Its radiation is the source of nearly all the energy on Earth. It is absorbed by plants, and when they are eaten by animals, it is transformed into the chemical energy that powers their bodies. Of course, the Sun could also chuck a hissy fit one day and fry us all. Not very likely, but possible. More often, when we think of the natural environment, we think of things on the Earth and I've listed some examples here. But from now on, remember, the wider universe is out there too. By the way, pause slides if ever you need more time to read stuff. The most complex thing we know of in the universe is the human brain. Read through these examples of brain processes quietly for a minute before I go on. The brain and its psychological domain of brain processes is forever trapped within the biological domain of the body and can only interact with the outside environment through the body. We perceive the outside environment through our sense organs, our eyes, our ears, etc. We act upon it through behavior, as in speaking, for instance. Somewhere within is I, the self. And it's a self that appears to us to remain fairly constant throughout life. Most psychologists regard it as only an illusion. But recent work by the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio, whom we will meet in the next module, suggests that the self is very real, exactly in the same way as our emotions and thoughts. Almost certainly, though, it is not anything separate from brain processes. The self is intimately connected with conscious awareness. When fully unconscious, there is no self. The I ceases to exist. Psychologically, we are social creatures, who engage in social relationships with other individuals and groups. And as a direct consequence of our sophisticated psychological processes, we are now enmeshed within an elaborate network of social systems, economic, legal, education, healthcare, and so on. We contribute to the social domain through our behavior, but that behavior is itself very highly regulated by the social domain. Social systems, in turn, operate according to the cultural expectations of the larger cultural group of which they form a part. The cultural domain is more abstract and consists of the shared language, values, beliefs, ideas, 
customs, norms of behaviour and traditions that have built up over time. It generally changes only very slowly in response to new patterns and pressures arising from within the social domain. Think of what Christmas involves in Christian cultures. What we do doesn't really make too much sense. And we pay good money for quite silly things. But tradition rules. Well, for most of us at least. Our sophisticated psychological processes and collective behaviour, coordinated by social and cultural rules, has enabled us to create a new kind of physical environment for ourselves. The built environment of homes, neighbourhoods, cities, buildings, shops, roads, things, machines, information technologies. To do this, we've had to consume and change the natural environment of the Earth. This image of the Earth at night captures the present extent and complexity of our intertwined built, cultural, social and psychological domains. Every point of light reveals a part of our built environment, constructed according to cultural traditions in the service of complex social networks to impact upon the behaviour of the billions of people who right at that moment in time were living their lives under those lights. Let's trace a simple interaction. First, Remember, we are always contained within and dependent upon the wider natural environment. And time, of course. OK. I, in my psychological domain of my cognitive processes, decide to build a house. But I can only make this happen by engaging my biological domain, my body, represented by arrow A, to perform the necessary actions. Those actions involve getting approvals, plans, building contracts, etc. through engaging with other people in the social domain, B. Of course, the style of house will be influenced by the cultural domain, C. Then builders and contractors from the social domain build my house, D. And living in the house impacts upon my sense organs, E resulting in all manner of nice psychological feelings and emotions, we hope, F. Of course, building the house has needed resources from the natural environment at some point, G. And now the new house further encroaches on the natural environment, H. I could represent interactions amongst environmental domains simply by all the one-way and two-way interactions. And this would be complicated enough, as shown here, but it doesn't really capture the full complexity that results from feedback loops that alter patterns of behaviour over time. Let's say I wake up one morning in late autumn and feedback from the natural environment via my body's sense organs tells me that it's a bright sunny day. I think I'd like to go kayaking today. Only trouble is I'm aware of the five plus two rule of the cultural domain. Five days work, two days rest. And today is a Friday, a work day. I could ignore that and chuck a sickie, but I'm aware of social pressures and fears of my employer finding out that I know would impact badly on my psychological domain and spoil my kayaking experience. So I decide I'll go kayaking on Saturday. But then feedback from the social environment via the media tells me it's going to rain on Saturday, returning to sunny on Sunday. So Sunday it is. On Sunday, I have to move through the social and cultural domains. For example, abiding by road rules to drive to the river. And of course, I must interact with the built environment, the car, the clothes and the safety gear I wear and the kayak to kayak in are all part of the built environment. Anyway, I get onto the river, but the weather turns cold. Sunny, but cold. And via the feedback from my sensory organs, I feel cold. And that's not a pleasant experience for me at all. And forever changes my memories to tell me to never again risk kayaking in late autumn. Even simple behaviours such as this implicate effects and feedback loops to generate relatively complex and evolving patterns over time. 
Notice that when it comes to behavior, it's the psychological domain through the body that's in the driver's seat, so to speak, even though there are multiple influences and responses involving the other domains.